Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And joining me today is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And we're going to talk about freedom of speech here at the Mises Institute. We are free speech absolutists. It's a basic property right. But I don't know if you've been looking out in the world and noticed that, man, the regimes of the world have just gone bonkers on hating on free speech lately. We got it going on in Europe, in France, in Brazil, and even in the U.S., which is probably the most free speech country on earth at the moment, and has been actually for, for quite a while. It's one of the few places where that issue has really stuck and become popular. Uh, but even here, we're seeing a lot of uh, action against free speech. And then this year, of course, we saw, uh, or this week rather, we saw the release of Mark Zuckerberg's letter admitting that uh, his company Meta, as he calls it, or, you know, Facebook, uh, was being pressured by the regime to basically just delete uh, information about COVID and just anti-establishment uh, talk about uh, lockdowns and that sort of thing and anything that the regime didn't like. And this all comes on the heels of other revelations about Twitter and a variety of other organizations where it's become clear that the federal government is very much trying to pull the strings behind the scenes to control what it is you can read and see, you know, the FBI, which pretends like it's out there solving crime, really they're spending a lot of time controlling and policing speech. That's what they do. They're the American KGB, and they want to make sure you don't see things that they don't like. So before we get to that, though, I wanted to uh, just mention, I think this is the last time we are able to mention it, is our upcoming conference in Albuquerque, Living free in an unfree world. This will feature me and Peter Klein. Be going down to Albuquerque to talk about what can you do just in your daily life um, to really express and build freedom in ways that aren't necessarily the usual activism type stuff. And I think Peter's going to talk really on the the topic of. Uh, a technology and how that feeds into it. I'm going to look more at uh, building up these institutions that the state has always hated historically, institutions like churches and families um, and even local governments in many cases. This is uh, states have always wanted centralization. They've always hated families, uh, at least families that were independent from the regime. And they've certainly have always hated independent churches. And we can see that over the last 500 years is clearly uh what the state wants to control and do away with. So we're going to look at some of those issues coming up in about 10 days. That's September 14th in Albuquerque. If you want to go, just go to Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S dot -E O-R-G. And click on events and you can register there. You can okay. turn down that power lineup. Make, make it yeah. a Klein. <laughs> That's right. It's a small Saturday. event. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, if you're interested at all in any of those topics, uh, I think it'll be a pretty good event, actually. Um, so certainly we'd be happy to see you there, um, where we'll be exercising our freedom of speech, uh, which the regime doesn't like. And let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I think this week... Uh, we were told what we already knew, right, where Zuckerberg, and it's still still a matter of theory as to why Zuckerberg decided to come out now and say publicly that, yes, the regime is pressuring us and, and was trying to get us to a censor, and we agreed. And what we see here is direct federal intervention in the freedom of speech. They were directly threatening a private company telling them that they weren't allowed to publish certain things. This is absolutely why the First Amendment exists, right? Regardless of your position on the incorporation doctrine, on the 14th Amendment, on whether the First Amendment applies to state and local governments, whatever, whatever, the First Amendment was written specifically to prevent the federal government, which is the branch of government, we're the level of government we're talking about here, designed to prevent the federal government from intervening in the private sector to control speech. But that's exactly what they're doing when they do this. And so we see the evidence right here. It's admitted now that the federal government is intervening to control speech. And when the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, 
regarding uh, the limitation of speech, well, you got to be like on a different level of naivete to think that, well, I, I suppose if it's just the FBI pressuring you, that's not Congress making a law, please. Give me a break. Uh, this is obviously the federal government trying to uh, censor people. That's all there is to it. And this is, of course, the revolution was very, that took place to combat this sort of thing. We talk about this a little bit more detail, right? This wasn't just something they made out of nowhere. This was a response to the absolutist regimes of Europe wanting to control speech. This was going back a couple hundred years, even in the 18th century. Uh, so that's the whole reason it exists. And it caught on, fortunately, in the United States. And uh, that's why we can say now that, at least in the U.S., there is some resistance to this, whereas you don't see nearly as much of that uh, elsewhere. Now, I, I just want to note, kind of just to provide you a summary of what was going on here uh, with, with Meta and the Feds, uh, we can quote just what uh, USA Today was saying about it. And so, yeah, let me give you the ultra-establishment version of what the basic facts of it were. So this is what the USA Today article said. It said, in a stunning letter to the House Judiciary Committee, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg wrote that the Biden-Harris administration pressured Facebook to censor content and then pushed harder after the company initially resisted the government's coercion. Uh, <laughs> this is that's pretty to the point. In the, letter re in the letter released Monday, Zuckerberg said that, quote, senior officials from the Biden administration, including the White House, repeatedly pressured our teams for months to censor certain COVID-19 content, including, including humor and satire, and expressed a lot of frustration with our teams when we didn't agree, unquote. Of course, we all know that ultimately they did agree, and we've seen this across other platforms as well. Um, so I think this just when we when we look at this, we look at other things that are going on. We look at how this uh, this judge in Brazil, De Moraes, uh, is attacking uh, Elon Musk because what they want is they want X to appoint a local representative in Brazil who the, who the Brazilian government wants to arrest. Basically, they want something they can hang over the head of of X Twitter and. Musk is absolutely right that that's the reason they want it. They want someone who works for X to be there in Brazil that they can arrest and then force uh, X to follow Brazil's rules. And Elon doesn't want to play that game. And so now they've shut down the entire website. So that's how Brazil protects your freedom. They shut down entire websites that say things the Brazilian regime doesn't like. This is a leftist regime, of course. Keep that in mind. Uh, what have we got? We've got the leftist French government arresting Pavel Durov. Uh, he's, he's the one who runs uh, Telegraph there, which is just a, basically another social media platform claiming that, oh, this is a place where criminals hang out. And then, of course, we've got the long history of attempts at uh, control here in the United States with, with Twitter. We've got the, the silencing of the New York Post, even when they released uh, the Hunter Biden laptop story. This was all known to be true, but the regime decided people shouldn't read about it. So they got the major platforms to shut that down. And then what do we got? We got Robert Reich saying that Elon Musk should be arrested. Uh, we got Alexander Vindman, who's this horrible, horrible uh, federal employee. I think he's like a member of the military or whatever. Anyway, he's never had a real job. He's like military intelligence, was working in Ukraine, uh, has always hated Trump uh, because Trump didn't support enough of Vindman's uh, neoconish ideology. And so Vindman's been out to get Trump for some time, and he refers to free speech absolutists, comma, weirdos, using the, the administration line to refer to people you don't like as weirdos, uh, which is just kind of weird. Um, that's, what, that's what you do when you're overcome with joy, though, is you refer to everyone you don't like as a weirdo. Uh, and then we've got, we've got Reich saying that there's too much free speech. Arrest Elon Musk. So that's what's going on with freedom of speech. And uh, this should be really alarming to anybody who actually cares about freedom of speech, which apparently doesn't include the American media anymore. The media used to pretend to be absolutist on freedom of speech. They obviously couldn't care less. So here we are, where it's only, quote unquote, weirdos who think that the freedom of speech should be absolute. Uh, but instead, we've got left-wing regimes everywhere trying to silence people, censor publications, destroy private property, and tell people what they're allowed to see 
and here. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised, but that seems to be the reality right now. Absolutely. And then, of course, there was, um, you know, for, for some context as well, there was a Supreme Court decision uh, a couple months ago where you had the state of Missouri, um, as well as some other actors who were suing over the uh, government, the Biden administration in particular, uh, going to social media companies, identifying individual actors who they saw as spreading misinformation and things like that. And there you saw the Supreme Court in a 6-3 decision side with the regime, surprise, surprise, um, defending that action, saying that there was no grounds for a lawsuit there, that they cannot demonstrate any damages, et cetera, et cetera. The government's position was, oh, well, they were trying to simply be a helpful, uh, you know, giving helpful guidance so that social media companies could uh, abide by their own rules relative to content. They're creating an enemies list of accounts that were spreading, you know, bad, bad things that the regime didn't like, right? You know, that, that certainly, that certainly doesn't come, come across at all as some sort of infringement from the state on freedom of speech rights. So this is something that, um, you know, it, it is, it is, there's still an element of a bulwark within the United States. Again, what we've seen with Elon Musk and it's the, 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 the increasing, I think, tension that exists between a certain aspect of Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, it seems the more time you spend on jujitsu mat, the more skeptic, uh, skeptical you get of the regime, which might explain some of Zuckerberg's uh, changes of late, as well as perhaps some leadership changes within Meta's organization as well. And of course, what's interesting is, uh, too, is the extent to which uh, the state has been proven to have censored truthful information. Of course, we should that, that distinction between what the regime deems as truthful and not should not really be a factor within this. But an aspect of that Zuckerberg letter dealt specifically with the security agencies, with F, the FBI, going to them talking about the accuracy of the, you know, stopping the spread of the Hunter Biden laptop story going into the 2020 election, where we know from the official government's timeline of events, they knew prior to that, that the laptop itself was Hunter Biden's laptop. And so that is an additional layer to it, where this goes beyond simply, you know, using the government's excuse within the Supreme Court case, right, about, you know, may, maybe you could make an argument, right, you know, theoretically, you could, you could understand why a private social media company, in theory, uh, might have certain types of content that it would censor. Maybe they make that decision that content that does not align with government, you know, you know, government health guidelines, et cetera, right? You, you, you could perhaps theorize a, an, an example there where um, you know, a social media company might find it useful to get some of these reports if you're gonna give every single benefit of the doubt to the state. But what is not against any sort of uh, code of conduct within these sites. What, what goes against that entire example is that Hunter Biden laptop example, which again, we know the state knew that it was an act, that, that it was in fact, that you had the entire propaganda campaign claiming it was mis Russian and, mis and misinformation. You had the state guiding social media companies to treat it as if it was Russian misinformation while the state knew, again, knew it was not. And so that's an entirely different aspect of it. Um, which, again, you know, considering the electoral aspect of it, goes directly into these larger conversations about direct election interference by the state and the way that it controls information. And yet, in spite of these issues that are playing out in real time in the United States, you know, the, the global environment is far, far more hostile. Um, again, you, you mentioned the Brazil situation, which, you know, there, there is a large amount of commentary out there, a lot of analysis out there about the similarities between Brazil's political situation and America's political uh, pl political environment, you, dealing with, with changes in you know, this kind of broad, uh, multi-ethnic nation states. Um, you have a very interesting dynamic there where um, kind of, the, again, as, as you mentioned, the, the big boogeyman from the Elon store with Brazil is the Supreme Court. That's obviously an element that the left would argue is not the case in the United States. So again, our Supreme Court had no problem rubber stamping that. Um, but you could very easily imagine a world where you have a stacked Supreme Court that is utilizing their ability to interpret the law and nationalize these sort of court cases, essentially becoming far more similar to what we're seeing play out with Brazil's restriction of of, of you know, freedom of speech, even though Brazil actually does have, and this is the point that Elon's, uh, Elon Musk has made, is that unlike many European countries, many other nations, Brazil technically has a freedom of speech component to its constitution, 
that their Supreme Court is able to discard at a whim um, engage in an extremely uh, heavy censorship. We saw it play out in the election that saw the, the fall of the Bolsonaro administration, where again, you, you literally had advocates of the Bolsonaro regime um, having to like do creative advertising with their products, you know, using Bolsonaro colors, using Bolsonaro numbers as a way of communicating support for Bolsonaro because of how strict the, cam the uh, uh, campaign rhetoric had become restricted in Brazil in that previous election cycle. Um, and I, I think this entire growing hostility, this, this, this state-driven hostility to Elon Musk, it's not simply Brazil. We're seeing increasing um, issues come up within Europe. You know, he's directly in the crosshairs here. And bringing back to the United States, you have Keith Ellison, who is, oh, by the way, the attorney general of Minnesota, uh, Walz's state, right, who is cheering on Brazil within the showdown over, speed of, uh, this, you know, over freedom of speech rights dealing with uh, with, with X down there. And so this is a situation where, you know, it, it, there is a, there's a, a technological dynamic here where, you know, we've, we've now had, you know, 12 plus years of social media playing a very heightened role within the electoral process, the way that mainstream alternative media has broken away at the, one of the regime's pillars of power, which was control over the press you know, particularly within the 20th century, the way that you know, mainstream television in particular had largely been captured by the preferred narratives of the regime. You know, various anchors were essentially doing the bidding of the powers that be. You had a breakdown of that with technology. Government is reacting by straightening their control over it. And what is happening play out in Brazil is probably going to end up playing out in Europe. Again, the, the situation with Telegram in France being a, a kind of a canary in the coal mine there, arguably. And so this has this this does create you know, this, this shows this global this global dynamic here, where again this this freedom of speech component is being attacked from all sides. And, so, and it's, it's more, again, it's more than just simply spooky Silicon Valley oligarch doing this. It is a direct state involvement. And again, we're now seeing kind of really play out within the legal sphere and recognizing that legal protections, again, the Supreme Court did not come in and save, you know, right-wingers on Twitter. Um, the Supreme Court did the bidding of the regime in this. And so this entire dynamic of, oh, well, it just says freedom of speech in the Constitution, and therefore that's going to protect us, and the legal system is going to work. And this should be another moment to the extent to which the regime does not really care about what is on paper. It will do whatever it can get away with. And it's always the same argument from these people. It's always about, oh, we have to balance your freedom of speech against the interests of the community, uh, which is exactly what people like Jefferson rejected. This idea that you don't, you can't say what you want if it somehow endangers the the community. Because what is the community? The regime tells us what the community is, virtually all of the time. And Robert Reich, right here, when his little rant about how uh, Elon Musk is being arrested. Little. What's that? Uh, Emphasis on little. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. It's been a while, of course, since I've seen this guy in video. But you're right. <laughs> His uh, he says, "quote Musk's free speech rights under the First Amendment don't take precedence over the public interest." Unquote. Oh. Okay. Well, here's the thing. They do take precedence over the public interest. That's the whole point of the First Amendment. Is that you have these rights even if the regime determines that the public interest is something else. But that's what they always say. Everyone who hates free speech always says it's against the public interest. That was why all of these classical liberals from uh, the olden days uh, in the 18th and 17th century, they were imprisoned because their quote unquote uh, free speech violated the public interest. This is, this is the essence of old uh, seditious libel laws was uh, for example, the leveler, Richard Overton. Now, the levelers were these great radical classical liberals who Rothbard calls like basically the world's first real libertarians by modern standards. Uh, Overton was one of their leaders, arrested, imprisoned for seditious libel. Why? For criticizing the regime. The crown said, oh, he's endangering the community. He's saying things that are demoralizing the community. And so they locked him up. 
Thomas Paine tried in absentia for seditious libel in the 18th century. Oh, his words, uh, they endangered the community. It's always that sort of thing. And then in 19th century America, they even tried this uh, during the, the so-called males uh, controversy. Uh, you're probably familiar with this, though, because you follow the, the times and travails of William Leggett, where Leggett, being a hardcore abolitionist, was on the right side of the males controversy. This was when a bunch of slave owners in the South tried to get and successfully managed to get the postmaster general to censor the mails, to prevent the distribution of mailed material, letters and such, in the South if those materials had abolitionist sentiment within them. So this was the federal government censoring the content of mailed items, letters and newspapers and such to do the bidding of one uh, social class. Now, what did that one social class, that is the, the slaveocracy as Rothbard called it, what, what was their argument? Oh, it destabilizes the community. It's a threat to the established order. It's gonna cause chaos. You can't just let people say whatever they want. This will overturn the established order is the, the phrase they actually use, gibberish term. Um, I guess they're not Christians because you know Jesus wasn't big on the established order uh, and hardly seemed to think that maintaining the established order was an important thing. Uh, and so that was their, their argument. It was the same garbage over and over again. Free speech endangers the established order. So in every century, the levelers in the, in the 17th century, Thomas Paine in the 18th, the, uh, the slave masters in the 19th, it's always the same thing. And then, of course, Woodrow Wilson in World War I, tons of censorship, people being arrested, people being locked up for saying anti-war things. I mean, that's why Eugene Debs was arrested, because he supposedly discouraged conscription and said things that demoralized people and, and made them think that the war effort was bad. That's what, that's what Eugene Debs was thrown in federal prison for. So this has always happened and it's always the bad guys that want to control free speech. So if you think that free speech needs to be better balanced with the public interest, with, with the good of the community, you're, you're on the wrong side. You're one of the bad guys. Every single example we look to where they want censorship, it's the bad guys. And yet that's who's in charge. That's who the left is telling us are the good guys or the people who want to censor. And that's what's going on right now. So, I mean, I just cannot believe when uh, you get people on here like Reich, who's cheering on the arrest of people like Pavel Durov, who's just some tech guy. Now, Durov was stupid enough to go to France and think that French law would protect him, uh, which it clearly did not. French. French law has never protected anyone <laughs> from the real exercising of their, their free speech. France is one of the places that innovated arresting people for saying uh, anti-Semitic things, quote unquote, as defined by the regime. So obviously your rights never uh, were protected there. And that's, that was true decades ago. And so now we've got Rice cheering that on. You got Vindman cheering that on. Uh, saying that, uh, yep, way too much freedom of speech. It's all misinformation. And just for the reasons that you pointed out though, right? What is misinformation? How did we know that the things being said about COVID and say the lab leak theory, right? Saying things that we now know to be true about the lab leak theory um, and the theory now considered to be perfectly plausible theory by most educated people to just say those things would have gotten you deplatformed off Twitter and Facebook four years ago. And so they don't know what's misinformation. They're just deciding ahead of time that you can say this thing, you can't say that thing. And of course, as we now know, it's all because the regime was pressuring to do them to, well, actually, I shouldn't say it's all because of the regime. That's what makes it partly dangerous, I think, is that the people who control these organizations, these platforms, especially at Twitter under the old management, these people so obviously were sympathetic to the regime. Uh, like Vijaya Geda, I think is how you say her name. I, I don't know. And Yoel Roth. When we looked at them and they were up testifying in Congress uh, during, after the release of the, 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 uh, the Twitter files, so obvious whose side these people were on, right? They were on the Biden side. They were on the regime side. They were on the establishment side. So they tried to then sort of claim that uh, the regime was turning the screws and they didn't want to do it and they really regret it and they're sorry. We all know they wanted to. We all know that they were more than happy to censor. And so when your private sector people 
are both anti-freedom and your government sector are anti-freedom, boy, you you got some real problems that you got to deal with. And that was really only the only a hole in that wall of censorship opened up uh, with Musk. And um, I mean, it, it's interesting how a lot of them then had to back back up because there was suddenly comp, uh, there was competition they had to deal with. Uh, whereas for a couple of years there. After COVID, you had every single major platform was all in lockstep in favor of the regime and censorship and claiming that everything they didn't like was misinformation. And they were able to get away with it. And it was really only after you had one single major platform start to be more liberal on that and liberal in the good way that you started to see some change. And other than that, you would have never heard anything, I think, from Zuckerberg uh, admitting some of the truth on this. And I still don't know why. Uh, it's, it's still kind of a mystery as to why he uh, decided to, to admit this. Uh, I don't know if he's just afraid of some sort of prosecution or something. Um, but there's plenty of data here now to just, yes, okay? The federal government was censoring people. We know they were. Of course, who's going to go, who's going to lose their job over it? Who's going to go to prison over these blatant violations of the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights specifically, which is the good part of the Constitution? Um, nobody. I, I, they, they all think they have the right to do it. And as you point out, the Supreme Court is fine with it. So uh, that's just the reality. But let's just point out that if you're siding with the regime on this, you're one of the bad guys. And I really don't think there's any other way around it. Well, and that's what's going to be interesting is that I think going forward, Again, you know, Musk is such a fascinating figure here because he is someone who has obviously been a, a massive uh, uh, receiver of government funds. Right, you know, Tesla received tremendous amount of government subsidies, getting it off the off the ground. Uh, SpaceX with its relationship with the government and things like that. Right, um, you know, this is someone who talks quite openly about how you know he was an Obama Democrat you know, from a political standpoint, not that long ago, and now is seen as, you know, whatever names attached to him, but it's still, you know, a, a centrist relatively politically. All, all these really disruptive figures in American political society today really are just centrist, which is what, what makes it all so fascinating. And, you know, when he took over X, right, he made it very clear that he was going to limit uh, the censorship rules within the platform itself. Some will argue with that. There are still people that complain about shadow banning, things like that. Fine, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that some of those concerns aren't necessarily invalid. But his framework for operating that he stated was going to be that they were going to allow for freedom of speech on the platform that was itself restrained by the rules of the countries that they are operating in. And so there are some areas where censorship is more heavier than it would be in the United States. We've seen this play out in practice already on X. And so the question will be from that, this perspective is, you know, X is at the, at the same time, particularly in the last several months, Musk has taken on a more explicitly adversarial rhetoric towards governments. Um, the Brazil case is a very obvious one, right? Um, he has been very critical of the British government. He has been very critical of, Brit of European governments. He talked last year about the possibility of X being removed from app stores within Europe because of EU regulations and the like. And then the Brazil case, I think, is particularly fascinating because from the, the legal perspective of X and the way that they have communicated the process, they, they view that the court is acting against the laws of the land within Brazil. So in theory, they think that their refusal to censor you know, from a government blacklist these accounts was itself abiding by the law of Brazil. And there's a very fat, you know, he's, 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 he's documentation here. And what, what's interesting as well is that, again, this goes to the, the explicit political dynamic there, is that of the accounts that were asked to be blocked, that were asked to be banned um, in Brazil included opposition figures in the government, right? So there was a Brazilian senator, it was a Bra Brazilian congressman, um, Nicolas Ferreira, who, who received more votes than any other congressman in Brazil, right? So that's, that, you know, for, for those that want to have like a democratic mandate and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, this is the guy that actually, you know, represents that more than many um, uh, political figures out there. Those are the people they want to be banned. Um, another was kind of a, pro a prominent podcaster called the, the Brazilian Joe Rogan. Um, that's the way that X explains the like, right? So, so here you have oppositional political figures that were asked to be banned without any sort of due process, done in secret, and against a freedom of speech 
as written in the as written the British Constitution. So from Elon Musk's perspective, right, is that X was upholding the law by not doing what the courts were asking to. Now, of course, the problem is is that ultimately the law is whatever the courts <laughs> say it is, right? The, the interpreter matters more than the laws that are written. And so, you know, the, 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 the people that have the power and the sticks and the ability to, to confiscate property of your companies, right? And this is another aspect to it, right? Is that because Elon has this vast kingdom of various companies and the like, these governments have had no problem going after SpaceX and Starlink. Um, no doubt it's gonna play out with Tesla and these other uh, business ventures that for one are actually profitable, right? You have this additional component on, you know, what it actually is the profitability of X right now. And so that's that's so the the question is is Elon going to end up perhaps talking a big game but then reverting back to not causing too many waves because he has to be concerned with the other business ventures attached to him as a personality and so therefore he is going to have to end up playing ball with these governments or is he going to live up to the rhetoric that he has recently espoused that does mark a very distinct tonal shift from him as an individual. I, I, I don't think I don't think Zuckerberg's going to be doing this. Right, writing a letter, very very interesting, right? But he doesn't seem at this point to to really want to be sort of a renegade billionaire, a renegade oligarch out there. Um, again, well, time time will tell on that. Um, but Musk seems to be wanting to be that figure, and so the question will be: To what extent is he going to uh, continue and, and and lean into this explicit? Um, hostility with governments, because this is not going to go away. These battles over information and tech are going to continue to, to escalate. And of course, one of the things that we have seen over time, and, and this is perhaps a positive spin on this, we don't get a lot of positive things on Radio Rothbard, but the positive thing is that for, for all the issues that exist out there with technology and, and for people that, that you know, are out there reading the Unabomber Manifesto and the like, and there, there's, a, there's a lot of aspects, right, where we can critique um, the, 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 the surveillance, the, the, the extremely troubling surveillance aspects that are a, have become a natural byproduct of the modern technical world. But what has also been created are end arounds around the state, v, you know, the use of VPNs, for example, to get around censorship re regimes in certain areas. The extent to which we've seen, again, this is you know, one of the test case points made for Bitcoin is that you know, even when China and other states took very, very heavy handed approaches on trying to restrict Bitcoin itself, peer to peer exchanges were not affected as much as the actual you know, Bitcoin exchanges and things like that, right? The, those intermediaries that the state was able to get their tentacles into and control the ability to bypass those going peer to peer has always been a strength of technology um, and, and what we've seen develop as end arounds around the state. And this is precisely why we've seen for, for years now this building drum of you know trying to, to attack encryption, trying to attack um, you know trying to attach more effective surveillance mechanisms, you know, by by order of of state authorities, by you know, various intelligence agencies and the like, to try to you know, this 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 spy versus spy game, right? Of private technological creations to get around the state, the state's adapting to to undermine the advances that have been made there. And this is a problem that's not going to go away anytime soon. This is something that's going to continue to escalate. And because again, like this, the, the, and the reason why is because again, as as we've seen play out, again, this this control of the narrative. These anti-regime lines ha are the number one concern that many of these, you know, particularly Western states, have. Um, because again, when people are dealing with the realities of the world we're living in, whether it's economic, whether it's concerns over crime, whether it's concerns about you know massive immigration, the like, that is what's sparking these non-ideological, um, but just kind of reactions to the nature that the, to, to the decline of quality of life that the states have given to residents, given to citizens. And that is what's creating this, again, this is not something that's gonna be solved with a change of an, uh, you know, with an election here, an election there, um, and things like that. This is gonna be a pressure that continues to build this, this backlash between the regime and their chosen narratives and individuals trying to speak out against it. All right, well, I'm, I'm very interested to see how it plays out. That's the thing is, it's it's wrong to assume that the people in the regime are dumb and have no ability to adapt to changes in technology because they always have the ability to hire away from the private sector. The smart people are doing all of this. 
They, <laughs> this has been going on for decades, right? When, ever since they were, the federal government was hiring Nazi scientists to help the U.S. create new technologies of war, the regime has never shied away from hiring away and taking control of the smart people who are doing what uh, is new and cutting edge in technology. So this, uh, uh, I don't think we should ever make the mistake of assuming there's some sort of impermeable wall between the two. And, and one aspect too is that a, a relevant point to this, and I, I think even that the founder of Gab has talked about this, is that you know one of the um, focal points in terms of policy that we saw from Trump world, you know, in 2016, you know, during during his during, you know when he was in office, right, was Section 230, and the extent to which well Section 230 needed to be undermined because that was what was allowing these private platforms, right, to censor and things like that. And that was always an that, that was always a bad view on what the ramifications of Section 230 would be. That if you removed Section 230 and increased the liability of tech platforms. Um, to you know, that, that, that where, the, where the government could go after them, you would see more censorship in these digital environments. So it's, it's also, and, and so that, that was something that I think even Biden came out. So you, you actually had this dynamic for a while where Trump and Biden were both talking about um, Section 230 reform, which would have been, ex which would have been a gigantic trap that the right almost fell into there. I think there's been a little bit, yeah, I think, I think Elon changed that to a certain extent. I think some of the, I think a lot of the anger at big tech as a general entity was what prompted that that uh, Section 230 backlash. Like anything that we can do to tear down these oligarchs, because all these oligarchs are, are against us. Silicon Valley is not our friend, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which, which you know, understandable from from an emotional standpoint. Um, you know, understandable from from a lot of different aspects. But again, this this is why when it comes to dealing with these things and trying to identify okay, what what you know, where are the pressure points that could be effectively used to defend. Um, you know, liberty to, to defend individual rights, you have to be very careful on exactly what pieces you are dealing with there. Because if, if you had um, eliminated Section 230 back several years ago when, when you know, again, a mainstream right was talking about it and Trump was in office, that would have made this, this environment that we find ourselves in far more dangerous. I um, mean, that, that's one of the problems that, again, the right has a lot of critiques on who the bad people are, you know, the, the, the main, you know, even, even the, you know, the dissident thinkers and whatever, right? But they fail to actually understand where the true problems really lie, which again, we can, we can go into a whole, you know, conversation about the extent to which, you know, monetary policy and financialization is what has, has driven a lot of the corporate consolidation, which has definitely played out in Silicon Valley as well as anywhere else. But again, that, that's why though, again, just simply being angry at a certain groups of people and doing anything you can to hurt them can end up creating the very rope that they will hang you with later on. Um, and so that's another aspect that needs to be appreciated within this larger conversation about big tech censorship. All right. Well, I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. Uh, thank you, though, for coming in today. And uh, we will be back next week with another episode. So we'll see you next time.